In today's video, I'm gonna be covering my most talked about luxury brand on this channel, and it is, you guessed it, Chanel, but not in the typical form of an unboxing or a review, because let's be honest, there's enough of those floating around on this channel and online. So I thought we'd do something a little bit different today and instead talk about the woman behind the bag and ultimately the $113 million brand that we all know today. And love it or loathe it, Chanel is definitely a brand that has made a mark on so many of us out there, not just in the fashion industry. And I thought it was probably worth covering some of the crazy facts about Gabrielle Chanel that you perhaps did know and perhaps didn't know. Gabrielle Chanel lived a very, very decorated life. I'm clearly not the only one that thinks this either because Chanel has been the subject of so many biographies, so many films. And most notable of all for me is the 2008 film Coco Before Chanel. It's played by the wonderful French actress Audrey Tattoo from Amelie. And she played Chanel in her early years from childhood to the founding of her famous fashion house. And honestly, the things that you learn in that film, as well as doing the research for this video, were so shocking, interesting, and very impressive, actually, that I wanted to put it all into one video for you. So I actually have 10 facts for you in this video, and they're pretty bulky facts, so stay with me on this one. I'll also throw out pictures and things where relevant. So I'll start off with number one, and this was actually one of the most shocking things that I actually learned about Chanel. Did you know that Coco Chanel was actually an orphan and that she was raised by nuns. So Gabrielle Bonner Chanel was born in 1883 at a poor house and she was actually the daughter of a peasant and a street vendor. So not exactly the upper class bougie beginnings that you would imagine for a fashion designer, but she would have actually be one of six children that the couple had together. And back then she had a pretty rough childhood and the family was very, very poor. They lived in rundown and cramped lodgings. They basically shared one room together, imagining eight people sharing one room. And actually when Chanel was just 12 years old, her mother actually died of bronchitis. So very, very sad. And her father, obviously he couldn't really handle it. He wasn't really making that much money. And he actually sent her two brothers to work at a farm. Meanwhile, he left the sisters to the convent of Orbazine, I believe it's pronounced. Don't come at me for butchering the French here. They actually ran an orphanage there. And she actually stayed at that orphanage until she was 18. And what's particularly interesting about the orphanage is that it was part of a religious order. And that religious order was called the Congregation of the Sacred Heart of Mary. And they're actually quoted for being founded to care for the poor and the rejected, including running homes for abandoned and orphaned girls. It was run purely by nuns. They were very demanding, they were very strict, and they taught the girls there how to sew. And obviously the sewing skills was one that would actually eventually lead to her life's work when she would eventually start her own brand. So for example, I have with me the reissue bag, the iconic bag. You actually see that orphanage and nunnery influence on details like the rosary chains on the bag straps. That's what would apparently be on the necks of the nuns. And also, not in this particular bag, but you can imagine in most classic facts anyway, the lining is usually burgundy, which was to signify the uniforms that the girls had to wear when they were at the orphanage as well. So there are a lot of details that would eventually go on to inspire not just the reissue bag, but also the classic flap. Now we are on to fact number two, and this is, did you know that Chanel started her first line of work as a cabaret singer? Yes, the only money she earned was that of singing at basically like a cafe concert venue, and she managed to accumulate some cash when she would essentially perform, sing, and then pass a plate around the audience to get some tips for her performance. Now, if you've seen the film Coco before Chanel, the film covers a little bit of this. It's quite a very fun part of the film. And it's actually when she was performing cabaret at these venues that Chanel got herself the very famous name of Coco. Yes, the Coco that we all know from Coco Chanel perfumes. This is the Mademoiselle version, but also the Coco of the Coco Handle, amongst many other bags and items of clothing that we all know from Chanel today. And actually there's a bit of speculation as to how she got that nickname in the first place. Now, one of them, and you actually see this in the film Coco before Chanel, is that she got the name Coco because of a song that she was performing. But on the other hand, according to an article from the paper, The Atlantic, Chanel was actually interviewed to have said that Coco was a shortened version of the word coquette, which is French 
for kept woman, which I even had to look up in English to find the definition of a kept woman being a woman who is kept as a lover for a married man. So ladies beware. But I guess in a way, the name Coco, regardless of what it meant, gave her a bit of an alter ego, a way of escaping her dire and traumatic upbringings and being frequented by a lot of celebrities and powerful people probably gave her a little bit of hope actually to leave her childhood and her humble beginnings behind. So little did she know, fast forward many years, she'd eventually be on the other side of the stage enjoying the performances and being invited to all the fancy parties instead of having to perform there. Now we're on to fact number three, and this one is perhaps a shocker for all of you bag lovers out there because actually Chanel did not start her fashion career by designing these bad boys behind me, no. She actually started by designing hats of all things. So actually with the help of one of her male admirers called Etienne Balsan, who I believe actually frequented some of her cabaret shows, you see how these things, you know, they all add up, hard work pays off people. And after she got very acquainted with Mr. Balsan, she actually opened her first millinery shop with his help around the age of 20. And this shop is located on none other than Paris's Rue Cambon, the legendary flagship store. And this store was opened in 1913, where she started out selling hats. And actually at her hat shop, she got a lucky break when a famous French actress called Gabrielle Dorziant became a fan of her hats. She actually sparked a trend after that and she got a lot of demand from a lot of clientele. And soon afterwards, she was able to add many other stores, one in Deauville and one in Biarritz just to start. And from that point on, she began making clothes. Obviously the image of Chanel is one of the classic flap or the reissue. I don't really see Chanel hats being really that promoted or coveted, which is obviously interesting because of Chanel's millinery heritage. But, you know, it's quite nice to learn that Chanel has, you know, her fingers are many pies. She's a very talented woman, obviously. Now we're on to fact number four, and this is that Chanel actually designed the famous interlocking CC logo all by herself. And they first appeared around 1924 on the bottles of her signature fragrance, the Chanel number no. five. There's actually a few theories floating around online while I was doing research as to where Chanel's inspiration for this logo actually came from. Now, a lot of them point to her inspiration being Catherine de Medici's royal insignia. And when I looked at the photo, I was like, mm, yeah, that's pretty much almost the same. And that's actually because Chanel may have actually seen that particular logo on a visit to a royal residence. Now, others also say that the insignia could have actually come from the walls of Chateau de Crema in Nice, where Chanel actually attended many parties there. And another possibility, and one that I find personally quite sweet, and it would be nice and fitting for the facts later down the line that I will talk about, is that the CC logo is actually an homage to the English polo player and Chanel's lover called Arthur Boy Capel, the man whom she honestly considered to be the love of her life. And it's actually speculated that the two Cs actually signify Capel and Chanel, and that's her personal way of keeping his influence and memory alive. And now we're on to fact number five, and it's quite fitting that we landed on this number because we're gonna be talking about the famous perfume, the Chanel number no. five. Because did you know that Chanel actually launched the first designer perfume? So what that means is she was actually the first to feature a designer's name on a perfume. Nowadays, it's very commonplace, but back then, it really wasn't. And the reason why it was called Chanel Number no. 5 is because she actually went to a fortune teller and the fortune teller told her that number five was her lucky number. Now let's move on to the next fact, number six, and that is Chanel's influence, not just in high fashion, but in culture and breaking centuries of trends. Her designs were pretty revolutionary for the time. And as one example of this, Chanel actually introduced the now legendary Chanel suit. And it had the collarless jacket and a fitted skirt. And this was launched in 1925. 
And the reason it was revolutionary at the time was because it borrowed a lot of elements of menswear and emphasized comfort over constraints of the popular fashion at the time, like the corsets and bodice. She actually was the first to introduce trousers for women to wear. She was really, really driven by practicality when traveling by gondola and when she was horse riding, she basically refused to wear a skirt and that obviously outraged the fashion world at the time. But now fast forward to modern day and they're pretty much a norm. And who knew that Chanel had a critical impact on driving the popularization of trousers of all things. And now another fashion trend that Chanel is also credited with popularizing, and to my surprise as well, is the iconic LBD, the little black dress. And this was another 1920s revolutionary design. She actually took a color which is once associated with mourning, and I guess still is to this day, but she made it chic, and she demonstrated to the world that it could be just as good for evening wear. And obviously now, to this day, still iconic. And actually her influence wasn't just on clothing. Everything that she did pretty much started a trend, challenged and pushed the boundaries. And just to name a few examples, so actually in the early 1920s, clearly this was Chanel's prime. She was actually spending a lot of time in the sun getting her tan on. And at the time this was still considered quite lowbrow. And then after those pictures started circulating, the resulting commotion actually set off a desire for a lot of women and men, I suppose, to get that sun-kissed glow. Chanel also popularized many other things like the short boyish or garçon haircut for women that we now see again as a norm today but wasn't back then pretty shocking at the time when you consider how long hair was in long dresses were also in and here she is probably rocking the short hair and the women's suit and with a tan on and to be honest good on her she now has made it so much easier for us today to look how we want and wear what we want now we're on to the next fact and this one's a little bit of a seedy or raunchy one we're going to be talking about chanel's many affairs with lots of high profile men and and probably other men that we just don't know about so she actually lived up to her coco or coquette nickname the first big affair that she actually had was the aforementioned businessman Etienne Balsan, who helped invest in the brand at the beginning. But she soon left him for one of his wealthier friends, who I mentioned before was called Boy Capel. And actually both men were really instrumental in setting up Chanel's first business. And Boy Capel in particular was an English aristocrat. He was also, I believe, a polo player, but also actually best known as being Chanel's all-time favorite lover. And actually the two met in 1909 while she was actually still the mistress of his friend, Mr. Bolsan, that we talked about. So she was a little bit of a red flag, our dear Coco. Despite all of that, Capel actually financed Chanel's first shops. And when she did create Ready to Wear, she actually used his fashion to inspire what's known as the Chanel look. Fast forward in fashion today, you know, Karl Lagerfeld even named the boy bag after our dear Boy Capel because he was so near and dear to her heart, despite being a married man, but we'll leave that to the side. They wrote each other a lot of letters. He would go to and from Paris to the UK. They wanted to be together, or at least that was Chanel's hope anyway. But tragically, before they could run off into the sunset and have that happy ending, Boy Capel actually died in a car accident just before Christmas of 1919. And obviously Chanel was devastated. Despite all of that, the affairs weren't over. In fact, that was just the beginning. So I don't know if it was to get over Boy Capel or she just liked the company of a lot of men, perhaps a little bit of both. But in any case, just to rattle off a small selection of high profile gentlemen that Chanel had been with. These actually include Pablo Picasso, the artist that we all know and had no idea, frankly, that she lived in the same decades as him, let alone in his bed, but there you go. Another being the Duke of Westminster, another also being the grandson of a Russian Tsar, 
and also the composer Igor Stravinsky. It seems that Chanel had a very decorated uh, sexual life, you know, potentially never really found love outside of Boy Capel, but I think she was probably trying to deal with the loss of Boy Capel, with some childhood traumas and things like that. We're not having a therapy session right now, but just to speculate, and actually, even outside the love life, Chanel as a whole was a pretty well-connected woman, and she had a lot of friends in high places everywhere, and namely politicians actually, but she actually met Winston Churchill in the mid-1920s through one of her lovers, the Duke of Westminster, and at the time the Duke was one of the wealthiest people in the world, and he had a lot of people with a considerable influence around him in his close circle. Churchill was one of those friends, and even before he was Prime Minister and through to when he was during the Second World War, apparently Chanel was a regular at his home. More than a decade later, during World War II, that friendship was actually used by the Nazis to try and form an alliance with England. Who would have thought Chanel would be the bargaining power between a war and global peace? Now we're on to fact number eight, and this is perhaps the most shocking of all fact, because did you know that later in her life, Chanel was potentially a Nazi spy of all things? The classified documents of the French secret services have actually revealed that she was registered as a member of an espionage group from Germany known as the Abwehr. During the German occupation of France, she actually got involved romantically or potentially tactically just to survive with a Nazi military officer called Hans Gunther von Dinklage and she was involved with him for almost a decade. She was actually so involved with the Nazis that she even had her own code name and she was referred to as Abwehr Agent F-7124, otherwise known as Westminster and she actually received quite a bit of special treatment actually. She even had permission to stay at her apartment at the Hotel Ritz in Paris and that hotel actually funnily enough also operated as German military headquarters. Now you'd think that the Nazi influences and her being a spy would have just stopped there post the war. She actually leveraged her Nazi connections to try and push out the two Jewish businessmen that were holding the majority share of her company. But thankfully for those businessmen, they actually managed to sell their majority state to some Aryan businessmen at the time during the war and then they were able to regain that investment and ownership post-war. But despite all of that, these businessmen known as the Wertheimers actually helped finance Chanel's return to the fashion industry in the 1950s, given that obviously there was a war going on, she had to close down a lot of her stores, they helped her rebuild and ultimately actually fast forward to this day, that same family still owns the Chanel business and they actually refuse apparently to speak on their dealings or the relationship that they had with Chanel. Now we're on to fact number nine and this is that Chanel actually lived in a hotel for more than 30 years. That, in her twilight years, she actually lived a pretty lonely and solitary life and she lived most of that in the Hotel Ritz in Paris. And she would spend most of the day in the apartment and then the nights in the Ritz bar. Now, I actually don't know why she decided to go for a hotel as opposed to a house or something, but I imagine she probably liked the hustle and bustle of the Ritz, all the people, the commotion. And it was also a testament to how much money she must have had to stay in a hotel, where she even passed away there during her final days. That is a segue into our final fact of this video, fact number 10, and that is Chanel sadly died a mademoiselle while she was actually still working on her designs. So she was a real slave to her craft. She actually died without having married before, nor having any children to leave behind. But she actually died on the 10th of January, 1971, at her apartment in the Hotel Ritz, after she actually returned from a walk with one of her friends. There you go, those are the 10 facts I have for you today. I think in terms of takeaways, needless to say, a very, very interesting, decorated and unexpected life. She's an icon to the fashion world and also culture. And it's honestly a true rags to riches story. I feel like it's a positive overall message despite all of the kind of twists and turns. Overall I think it signals that hard work really does pay off and you've got to do what it takes to survive and get out of your dire circumstances you know. I don't necessarily think we can be all so quick to judge 
what she necessarily had to do, especially during those kind of wartime periods where a lot of actually um, brands had to also do the same thing. I admire her grind, her work ethic, and how she managed to get herself out of a very, very back foot start to life. Parents couldn't offer her anything. She was raised in an orphanage to being one of the most recognizable people in the world and having one of the most powerful brands in the world today where they can go on crazy price increases and people will still buy the product. And even despite all of her balances with famous men and how I'm sure a lot of people have opinions on it, myself included, you know, from a personal moral level, to be honest with you, no amount of bed hopping would have been able to promote a rubbish brand if she didn't have talent or any kind of knack for business. None of it would have really mattered, even if she got the investment from all these people. Every brand and every person has a past. And the single thread that I feel like is consistent throughout her life story is that she was completely dedicated to her art and her craft. And I feel, hopefully at least, that everybody is a little bit better off with a slice of Chanel in their life. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed researching her. She's such an interesting woman. Let me know your thoughts down below and if there's other designers you think that I should cover, I would love to know. But thank you as always for watching and I'll catch you in my next one.